So I do believe that God has a word for us in this house. God's been setting you up this morning. Are you ready for that? God has intentionally, listen to this, God intentionally engages you. Open your Bibles with me to the book of Exodus. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 33. Hallelujah. Father, we thank You this morning for Your Word. We thank You, Father, that Your Word is alive. Your Word is powerful and sharp. Father, Your Word is dividing the flesh from the Spirit. Your Word is causing us to hunger after You in greater ways. Father, You're moving us out of the norm into the super norm and bringing us into a place to where we know Your voice, we recognize it, we, we, we heed to it, and we cause Your kingdom to come in this earth, in this nation, in this state, and in this region, like it is in heaven. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. In, in Exodus chapter 33, Moses begins to talk about an encounter, or he describes an encounter with God that, what, that we could only imagine of. Everybody say, imagine of. Here's the good news about that. God is able to do abundantly above all you could ever imagine or you could ever, th ever think. We're shifting into days of encounters. We're shifting into the days of God's presence. We're shifting into a, a season of time in history that God's Spirit is being revealed. His presence is being revealed like never before. I don't know if you recognize yet what God's doing here, but Neil and I, we're after the presence of God. We're hungry for the presence of God. We don't need to hear from preachers. We need to hear from heaven. Amen? We need God's impartation and direction in our life. Let's look at this account that Moses and Joshua had. Verse 7. Now Moses used to take the tent and he pitched it outside the camp a good distance from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And it came about whenever Moses went out to the tent, and all the people would arise and stand each at the entrance of his own tent. Look what it says. And gaze after Moses as he entered the tent. Do you notice that? Moses said, anybody that wants the presence of God, get out of your tent and follow me outside the camp to the tent of meeting. If we really want God's presence, we got to get out of our boxes. Amen. we got to move outside of our comfort zones. we got to leave what's normal and begin to move in what is supernatural. God desires for you to know Him in a great way. See, religion says that God is way up there somewhere and you'll get to see Him one day when you die. You'll get to encounter Him face to face whenever you leave this earth or whenever He returns again. But God says the kingdom way to encounter Him is to hunger for Him. Amen. I want just to break off of you the religious expectations that religion has put on you about encountering God. And I want to just decree over your life this morning that you can encounter God any time you have a hunger pain. Amen. When your belly growls, you go to looking for food. Am I right? Some of you right now don't even have to be prophetic. You're thinking, how long is this going to be? I'm hungry already. All right. Fred, Freddy. <laughs> Am I right? When you have a hunger pain, you go looking for food. When your spirit has a hunger pain, you go looking for the presence of God. But the good news is, the presence of God is not something now that you have to go search for. He is in you. He is in you. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is in you. The Bible says that Jesus, the hope of our glory, He is in us. You don't have to go and look somewhere for Him. You just have to get out of your comfort zone. You have to be willing to do what other people are not doing. Moses gave them an invitation, and he said, if you want to encounter God, follow me outside the camp. Everybody say the camp. The camp is a place where everything's provided for you. Where everything is there. Food is there. Shelter is there. Covering is there. 
protection is there. Everything that you need is inside the camp and is provided for you by whether it may be structure, it may be things that you've worked for, government put in place. But God is saying, if you want to encounter me, step outside those things that are bringing you the comfort and the peace on a day-to-day basis and let my presence be that for you. Come on. See, we put so much stock in how we work. We put a lot of stock in the money we make or the protection or the provision the government brings to us. But God's saying, my presence will provide everything for you that you need. It goes on to say here, and it came about, verse 8, that when Moses went out to the tent, all the people would arise. They would stand each at the entrance of his tent and gaze after Moses as Moses entered the tent. See, Moses said, come go with me into the presence of God. And the people, they stood up, they looked like they wanted to go, but they stood there and leaned against their door and just watched Moses. See, so many times we want people to go in for us and bring us back what they get so our life can be a little bit better. But God said, you've got to get out of your tent to get into his tent. Testing one, two. Amen? you got to get out of your tent to get into God's tent. And God's saying, I may not move in your house. I want you to shift into my house. For things are different in my house. Things are set up different in His house. The only thing that's in God's house is His presence. Amen? Look what it says here in verse 9. It says, Whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent. The Lord would speak with Moses. So when Moses walked in the tent that looked like everybody else's tent, the glory of God would fill Moses' tent because Moses' tent had been designated as the tent of meeting. See, God's not going to meet you on your terms. He's going to meet you on His terms. Isn't that amazing? We say, well, God, look, I'm busy this week. If you'll just meet me when I'm praying as I'm driving down the road to work, if you'll just meet me then, or if you'll just meet me while I'm cooking, or Lord, while I'm laying in the bed. You know one of the greatest sleeping pills is the Bible? You can, or prayer. You can lay in your bed and start praying or reading the Bible. You're gone. You're out. Thank you, Lord. Minister to me in dreams and visions. All right? But God wants us to be intentional about His presence. We were intentional this morning. The worship team was intentional about bringing us into the presence of God. And God's presence was resting in this place. He's still here, by the way. It was resting in this place in a very tangible way. How many of you could feel the presence of God? Amen? We've got to leave our tent to get in God's tent. God never even needed a majority to do a thing. He was only looking for a remnant. Do you believe today, I believe, Neil, that this body of believers can bring a revival and awakening to this nation like never before. The Bible says in Acts 17 that they that turned the world upside down had come into that place also. Jesus took 12, put them in an upper room with 500, all of them left but 120. Then He poured out His Spirit and 120 stepped out of a room and 3,000 got saved. And when 3,000 gave their life to the Lord, Those, they went into all the world and began to share about the presence they encountered. Isn't that amazing? You and I in this room, if we would become hungry for the presence of God and believe that God really wants to meet us, He will fill our hearts so full and our lives so full of His glory that when you go out into a place, you are carrying the tent of meeting with you. You're actually the tent yourself. Whoa! Verse 10. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing by the entrance of the tent, all the people, they would arise and worship each at the entrance of his own tent. Now look at this. God gave very specific instructions. He said, if you want to encounter me, come to my tent. Leave your tent. Moses went in, we'll see in a minute who went with him, but when Moses went in, the pillar of glory, the pillar of God's presence, the weight of His glory filled the tent. 
and he began to speak to Moses. And everybody that was still in the camp, looking out of the camp, seeing Moses get an experience, they stood in their own tent and they worshipped. But the fact was, God wasn't there. He wasn't in the tent with those worshiping. So it doesn't matter if you're singing or going through all of the, the Christian calisthenics that we may do in church. It doesn't mean God is there. God says, I'll meet you in this place. If you don't show up, He doesn't ring you and say, can I come over? Because this is not about you. It's about Father. It's all about Him, His will, His glory, His purpose, His intent for the earth. And God says, if you'll get in my glory, if you'll get in my presence, I will speak to you. The people in their doorways of their own tent worshiping did not hear the voice of God. Moses heard the voice and the instruction of God. The other people were just singing a song. Selah. Verse 11, it says, Thus says the Lord, thus the Lord uh, used to speak to Moses. How did He do it? He did it face to face. Everybody say face to face. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man spoke to his friend. When Moses returned to the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, everybody say a young man, a young man would not depart from the tent. Moses was followed into the tent by the next leadership in the next generation. Hmm. The Bible says God spoke to Moses face to face. Now, I want to I want to demonstrate this to you because... Come here, Joe. Come here for a minute. Hear my sermon illustration. <clears throat> Isn't she a beautiful sermon illustration? <clears throat> when we see this and we read this, we think that God spoke to Moses face to face and had conversation with Moses. When you read this and you look this particular phrase face to face up, it's not saying that they're talking like this. It actually means cheek to cheek. So that Moses could see... Alright, that's another sermon. <laughs> Moses could actually see what God was seeing. And Moses could look at what God was looking at. Thank you, dear. So Moses, in the tent, God brought him up and he put his cheek to Moses' cheek and he said, Moses... I want you to begin to see what I'm releasing in Israel. I want you to begin to know, not just hear, but see. Why? Because when God speaks, God's words are created. God said, let there be light before there was light, and then light showed up. Huh. Isn't that wonderful? God said, let there be birds in the air. Pow! There were birds. He didn't have to have a meeting or a, a research and development session to try to figure out the best way to make a bird. His Word made the bird, the fish. It made all creation. And God said, Moses, come here. I want to get cheek to cheek with you so you can see what I'm saying. It's important to see what God said. Not only hear what God says. How do we see what God says? We get cheek to cheek with Him. And we let our eyes be fixed on what God's eyes are fixed on. And God's eyes are fixed on awakening. God's eyes are fixed on revival. God's eyes are fixed on transforming this world to be like heaven. Hallelujah! Amen! He said He spoke to Moses face to face. It says that whenever Moses left the tent that Joshua, the next leader, hadn't been appointed, had no authority. He was just Moses' tag-along at this particular juncture. He got to where he led the army because he was zealous and he wanted to take land for, for God. He wanted Israel to come in his own. And Joshua went in to the glory with Moses. And when Moses got his assignment and he left, Joshua said, uh, Moses, go head on. I'm just going to sit here a while. And it didn't say the cloud left when Moses left. It stayed with Joshua. 
because Joshua was hungry. You don't have to be the leader to experience the cloud of God's glory. All you got to be is hungry. How many of you are hungry for God this morning? Come on, give Him a praise today. How many of you are really hungry for the Lord? Hallelujah. It says here that Moses left, but Joshua stayed. Let's read on verse 12. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people. But you yourself have not let me know who you will send with me. Moreover, you have not said, I have known, you have said, I have known you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Moses is revealing what God said in the tent. He said, He said here, Lord, you said to me, bring up this people. Wow. Moses was getting ready to embark on some of the toughest, bloodiest, hard days of his life. And he was ready to do that. God does not promise us that things will be easy, but He does promise us that things will be victorious. Amen? He told the disciples, those that were wanting to follow Him, He said, birds of the air have nests, the Son of Man has no way to lay His head. He was telling them it's not going to be easy. It might even be uncomfortable and painful at times. It might not look like you wanted it to look, but you will have the victory. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord some praise. He said, bring up this people, but you yourself have not let me know who you will send with me. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Moses was telling God, look, I got your instructions, but who's going with me? God didn't tell him. He just said, I know your name, Moses, and I know that I've given you favor in my sight. See, you don't have to know everybody going with you. You don't have to have all of it together. You just got to know that God knows your name. And that God has given you favor. Do you know what favor is? Favor is when doors open for you that normally would not open. When people begin to like you that normally wouldn't like you. People begin to notice you that normally wouldn't notice you and bring you into their circle for blessing and the release of God's purpose. That's favor. Come on, somebody. Whoa, hallelujah. Verse 13. Now therefore I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways, that I may know you, so that I may find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. Moses is saying here, yes, I know you have said that I found favor, but let me find favor. What did he say? God, I know you said I have favor, but would you manifest that favor in my life as I go and not when I get there. And Moses said this. He said, please also remember that this nation is your people. Moses came out of the, out of the presence of God and Moses had vision for the nation. Not only for his personal breakthrough. Guys, we've got to shift this. God's about nations. God wants this nation to change. We've been asking God, change me, change me, change me. You can get it by getting in His presence, by getting in His glory. But God wants us corporately coming together as His body to see Australia change. God loves this nation. And we say to the Lord, Father, don't forget that this nation is your nation. And your purpose in this nation is your purpose. And your favor on this nation is your favor manifested in this nation, Lord. We cannot leave out of the glory of God with selfish intent. It must be about the greater plan of God. He said, my presence, look at verse 14. He said, my presence will go with you and I will give you, I will give you rest. Then Moses said back to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. What we experienced this morning was the heaviness of God's presence. And God told Moses, If 
Or God said to Moses, my presence will go with you. Moses said, if your presence won't go, please don't send us. That's my prayer. God, if your presence isn't going before us in this, please don't send us. Don't let us do our own thing. Don't let us get caught up in what we used to do or what we used to experience or what we used to try to build. Let us build out of your presence. Let us build out of your glory. Can somebody say amen? Moses heard God say, my presence is going. But Moses said, but if it doesn't, if you change your mind, make sure we know your direction. Isn't that good? Moses wasn't calling God a liar. He was saying, if your direction changes, please don't let us wander off over here. Keep us in your glory. And that's my prayer, Neil, over us and over this work and over this region and this nation. It says God shifts. We shift. As God steps, we step. And we won't get out of rhythm with the beat of heaven that we'll be able to move with the cloud and move with the fire and be in the middle of the outpouring that God is bringing to this nation. Does this make sense today? He said, for how can it be known that I have found favor in your sight and your people if it's not by you going with us. Man, that wrecked me when I read it. Moses had a revelation. A lot of people today said, I got this. Hang on. Hold my communion cup. I'm going to do it. I've gifted it. I've got it. And they run on and do it. And they say, look what I did. And it falls. Moses said, oh no. Don't do us that way. Don't do us that way, Lord. Let Make sure that we are in the middle of what you're doing so that the people will know that we found favor in your sight. Look what it says here next. It is not, it be, it is not by your going with us so, so that we, I and your people, we may be distinguished from all other people who are upon the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing of which I have spoken for you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. There's some keys in this that we need to get out of what God is saying to Moses about presence. The presence of God is not just to make you feel spiritual and jump around. Come on, smile at me on Sunday morning. Amen? It's not. The Scripture said in verse 14, it said that when you're in the presence, there's rest. Everybody say rest. It's important to rest. I've had people come to me and I'm so thankful for it. They're saying, Do you have have you had time to rest? You've been going and going. Have you had time to rest? We find rest in the presence of God. It's good to have a vacation, yes, and we'll get one one day somewhere, somehow. But there is rest in the presence of God as you're running in your assignment. You can run and not grow weary. You can walk and not faint. As you're serving God in whatever sphere of society that He's called you to, the place that you work and that you serve and that you live, those places are assignments for you. And if God's presence is there, you are there. There is much rest for you in your assignment. The Bible said in verse 16 that there's favor coming to you. I gave you a little bit of what favor meant. But favor also means grace. Everybody say grace. Grace opens doors for you that could not be opened. And it closes doors for you that need to be closed. Some of you are going in and out of doors that God needs to close for you. Yeah, everything's seasonal. Everything is seasonal. Everything's, the only thing that is permanent is God. Even you are seasonal. There's going to be a season we're going to stand and we're going to say, he was a good guy. We loved him. He loved God, right? There's going to be a day that you're going to pass on into glory. But we've got to understand this, that grace closes doors. Grace opens doors. And according to Romans chapter 5 and verse 17, grace empowers you to become kings. To reign in this life, which means to have authority in the sphere that God has set you in to influence and to change. There's favor in the presence of God. So when you feel the presence of God into the room, don't just go, wow, God is here. Understand, rest is being imparted. 
favor is being imparted. And then the purpose of the presence will cause the cloud to come into your life. The presence of God, the cloud of God, is so that you carry that presence with you everywhere. He leaves with you. Isn't that good? Yeah, you don't have to say, well, I can't wait to get back to church on Sunday so I can get a touch from God. God's touch is living in you. You carry the Spirit of God everywhere you go. He is in you. Your hope of glory. Can you say amen? The Bible says that His presence in verse 15, His presence makes you dependent upon His presence. His presence makes you dependent upon His presence. His presence is addictive. Some of y'all have come out of addiction. You're alcoholics, you were drug addicts, and you were addicted maybe to porn or different things like that. You came out of addictions. You knew what the power that addiction had on you. Well, let me tell you, the presence of God is addictive. When you get in it, you're going to want to get back in it again. You're going to want to live in it, not visit it like Moses did, but you're going to want to live in the glory. You're going to want to live in the weight of God's presence. You're going to want to carry Him everywhere you go because everywhere you go, you're going in rest. You're going in favor. You're going in the power of God. Not some religious label, but the literal power of the Creator of the universe is going and flowing through you. Man, I feel this thing this morning. The power, the purpose of His presence is to come and to possess your heart. Wow. Your heart is not talking about the thing that beats in your chest. The heart is your consciousness, your values, your philosophy, all that you live out of. That's your heart. David said, and, and it was quoted this morning, that our, our heart is it, like the deer that pants for the water brook. Our heart's longing after you. Why? Because we've tasted and we've seen that God is good and we want another drink. We want another taste. We can't live without His presence. We're addicted to His presence. There have been times that I've been in services and I've sat there and I've prayed in the Spirit and it's deader than a doornail. Not here, praise God, but other places. And I'm like, Father... If you're not going to be here tonight and you don't want to do something here, can we just go home? I've got no desire to perform for anybody. I've got no desire to prophesy over people just because they say, hey, could you please give me a word? I want you here. It's one thing to minister out of the gift, and we can do that. There's no problem in that. But it's another thing to minister out of His presence. There is a flow of the river of God from His throne when you're ministering out of His presence. And it's easy. It's not tiring. It doesn't wear you out. It doesn't put you in a place of depletion. When you leave, you're still as full as you were or more when you came in. That's the presence of God, what it does. It makes you dependent on the, on the presence. The, pre the purpose of His presence is to possess what the blood has bought. Hear that statement again. The purpose of God's presence in your life is to possess, take possession of what the blood of Jesus has bought for you. Many of us in this room have not experienced the totality of what the blood of Jesus has purchased for us. It gave us a new covenant. It gave us a, a better way, a new and a living way. It, it didn't just get you into a place where you can go to heaven. So many people think the blood of Jesus is just about washing your sins away and getting you into heaven. No, the blood of Jesus brought a new covenant for you and I to operate out of in this earth, which says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Do you believe that today? that everything that you need, that my God will supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So many of us are living in lack. But Jesus said, I've already supplied everything that you need for your assignment. Just get into my presence and that's where you'll find it. 
the Bible says that by the stripes of Jesus we're healed. Is it true? Isaiah prophesied, you'll be healed. Peter testified, you were healed when the blood was shed from Jesus' back. Many of us have sickness and disease in our bodies. We have things that are plaguing us. And we say, well, it just has to do with the old fallen sin nature of man. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. He redeemed us from the curse of Adam. And he conquered death. He conquered hell. He conquered the grave for you. I've seen God heal. I know God heals. And I know God wants to heal you. God healed me of arthritis in my back as a teenager, taking medication three times a day. God touched me in a Charles and Francis Hunter meeting. I don't know if y'all know who they are. The Happy Hunters. Some of you guys will know who they are. He said, he gave a prophetic word. Somebody here has this. I said, it is me. And I went up and before he could touch me, the power and presence of God hit me and I fell under the power and got up healed. I've seen blind eyes open, many, many blind eyes. Deaf ears open, gorders in people's neck, big as a as a as a as a cantaloupe, a, a stone melon. Is that what you call it? A stone? What do, you, what do y'all call cantaloupes? A rock melon. I knew it had to do something that was hard. We've seen people that are lame. They come in on stretchers, walk. We saw a lady one time. She was sitting in a straight chair. She gave her heart to Jesus. We went to the ocean and baptized her in the chair, sitting in the chair, baptized her, brought her up. She grabbed her chair and walked out of the water. I know Jesus is a healer, but the problem is we say, will Jesus heal me? No, Jesus won't heal you. He's already healed you. It's available now. It's not in the future. It's in the past, 2,000 years ago, that healing was made available for you, and it comes out of His presence. Not out of religion, but out of His presence. What is the purpose of the presence of God? The purpose of the presence of God is to release His power. It says, the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken for I have for you have found favor in my sight and I have known you by name that speaks of intimacy see I'm, I know some of you very well I know Jason I, I call Jason my name and some of you I call you somebody else's name but I will get to know your real name I promise you will Frony it took me a minute but I got you amen we're learning, I'm learning, but God says, I'm not a guest at your house. I know you by name. I know every hair that is on your head. I, I help God out. He don't have to count nothing but eyebrow now. Praise God. We know these things. God is intimate with us. He's personal with us. He's not going to visit this guy and say, well, wait a minute, I'll see you tomorrow. His presence is available for you every moment, every second of every day to bring about His will and His covenant in your life. Does that make sense to you this morning? Hallelujah. Give God some praise. Hallelujah. Let me close up with this this morning. Look down at verse 21. Then the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about while my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. God told Moses about his glory. He said, I'm going to let you see me outside the tent. But you can't see me face to face outside the tent. You can only see my hinder parts. So I'm going to put you in the rock, and I'm going to put my hand to cover you, and I'm going to pass by you. And when I pass by you, I'm going to remove my hand. And what you're going to see of my glory is not my face, but my back. I thought, why in the world would God let Moses see his face cheek to cheek in the tent and outside the tent only the back 
I believe the Lord said in the tent, in the intimate places where His glory comes, is where I, we get our instructions for Him. God shares His vision with us. He gives us the download of what He wants to do where we live. But whenever we're outside the tent, we don't need His face, for we've already seen His face. We just need to follow where He's going. Follow Him from the back. Let Him go before us and prepare the way. Just as John the Baptist was the forerunner for Jesus, Holy Spirit is the forerunner for you. Did you get that? He's going before you. He's opening doors for you. <clears throat> and let's don't confuse this or let this be deposited in our heart in a religious capacity. Uh, it, uh, it, 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 this is a very natural thing. It's natural for you and I because we were created for the presence of God. We were created to live and to operate out of the presence of God. Let me prove that to you in the next few minutes. Amen. Don't watch the clock. This is my first closing. Amen. When God created things, God created the atmosphere of things before He created the product. Which means God's more interested in the atmosphere or the environment than He is the product. The word Eden in Genesis, it literally means presence or environment. That's why they cannot find Eden today is because it is not a physical place on the planet. It is the environment or the presence of God that was placed in a place for Adam to begin to work out of so that he could be fruitful, he could multiply, he could subdue, and he could replenish the earth. God created Eden before He created Adam. God created the sky before He created the birds. Am I right? He created water before He created the fish. He created the earth before He created seed or before He created plants. Why? Because the environment for the product to thrive in had to be created before the product was created. Because without the proper environment, the product could not live and produce as it was designed to do. Does that make sense? So, before God created bird, He created the air. Before He created the fish, He created the water. Before He created the trees, He created the earth to stick the tree in so that the tree could live. Before He created man, He created Eden. He put His presence in a place, and the Bible says in Genesis 2 that He picked man up and He put him into Eden. He put man into His presence. Because God intended for us to live function and do life out of his presence amen if you take a bird out of the air he won't he can't be bird if you take a fish out of the water it, it, it flops around on the boat floor or wherever it is and makes its way to the grill it can't live it's going to die out of the water you pull a tree out of the ground and the roots are exposed it won't be long till that tree is dead and withered up why because you took it out of its designed environment that would cause it to flourish. When you take man out of the presence of God, you get murder, you get theft, he messes everything up, society goes to hell, everything is messed up. We've got to take man and put him back into the presence of God, the Eden of God, that you were created to function and to live out of. And as you are living in the presence of God, life will begin to flourish for you. You put the tree in the ground, it grows, and its branches go wide, and fruit comes upon it, and you can eat of it. When we are put back in the presence of God that we were created to live and function out of, you find your purpose, you find your identity, and you begin to walk out your destiny. You cannot do it by just an education, by just money or any of those things. It must come out of the presence of God. You were designed to live and to function out of presence. Mm. We come to church like this to get pumped up. 
But when you come into the house of God next week, I'm believing that throughout this week, you're going to have such encounters with the Father that you're going to come in here and there's not going to be enough room in this building for the presence of God that you bring in with you. Think about it. Pursue His presence. Ask Him for His presence. Father, where do I meet you? What do you want to do? Let your glory fill my life. See, religion says, come get it. God said, it's already in you. Religion says, you've got to be good, you've got to be perfect, you've got to do all these things. The T's have to be crossed, the I's have to be dotted, and then God will see a pure and a holy vessel, and you'll be able to have the presence of God. That's religious hogwash. People say, God can't look on sin. Oh, damn. He does. He looked at us this morning. We messed up this week. We've done things this week that wasn't pleasing to God. Haven't you? Don't answer. But God still is favoring you. God's still pouring His goodness in your life. God's still healing you. It's not an excuse to run and just be wild. It's, that's not it at all. It's actually power to live restrained in the glory pursuing his purpose and his will. How does he do it? The first thing he does is the baptism of Holy Spirit, the infilling of Holy Spirit in your life. And if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, my friend, you're going to struggle. He is the presence of God. You're going to kick and scream and you're not going to understand everything. But if you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the infilling of Holy Spirit in your life, oh, you've got the power of God in you then. How do I do that? How do I get Holy Spirit in my life? How do I receive Holy Spirit in my life? It's so easy. You just ask. You just ask. You, Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me, Lord. Let Holy Spirit come into my life more and more. See, the baptism of Holy Spirit, it's not you getting more of God. It's God getting more of you. Because when you got saved, you didn't get a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of the Father and a sprinkle of Holy Spirit. You got all of God. But when the baptism of Holy Spirit happens in your life, it's God getting more of you. You surrendering to Him and becoming who He created you to be. Isn't that beautiful? That God designed you to hold and house Him. Come on, let's just lift our hands for a moment. Lift your hands up. Begin to just worship Him. What happens when the presence of God comes into my life? What are some of the things I could expect to manifest in my life? One is speaking in tongues. You get your native language back. You get that heavenly language that, 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 that the devil can't understand. But the Father knows that it's actually Holy Spirit praying through you. There, be, there may be a manifestation of you see things prophetically, you hear things, or you worship, you praise, you prophesy. There are different things that manifest when you receive Holy Spirit into your life, but there is evidence that He is there. I believe this morning that Holy Spirit is going to begin to fill some of you that have never, ever been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. I want all of you in the room this morning, if you would, just stand to your feet. I'm going to ask our pastors here to come and stand up here with me. Those of you that have you've been approached already to come and help us pray. Hallelujah. If you're here this morning and you say, Greg, I've never been baptized in Holy Spirit. I've never spoken tongues. Come on, guys. I've never had that experience in my life and you want it. I want you to do something bold. I want you to step out of your seat and just come and line up right here. You guys, if you would, just spread across all the way across here. Spread it thin. We're going to begin to pray for people. You may say, well, what if I don't receive it? What if you do? What if you do? Come on, step out of your seat and come. 
If you're here this morning, you say, I need a fresh infilling. I've been filled with the Holy Spirit, but today I'm empty. I need a fresh infilling of what God is doing in my life. I want you to step out and come right now. God is calling this area the tent of meeting for you today. And you're going to begin to receive from God that fresh impartation and infilling of His Holy Spirit like you've never experienced before in your life. You are becoming the tent of meeting. Come right now. Come on. Just a couple minutes. Oh, what a beautiful name. What a beautiful name. What a beautiful name. Thank you, Lord. Freddie, you guys just begin to sing that song if you would. Come on. Yeah. God's moving in your midst. I want you just to lift your hands and begin to worship the Lord. Those of you in the altar this morning, just begin to lift your hands and begin to cry out to the Lord. Just begin to praise Him. Begin to worship Him. Begin to call on His name. Father, we thank You this morning for that fresh impartation of Holy Spirit. That Father, Your Word said when we laid our hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. Father, some are here for just a fresh touch. Some are here to receive for the very first time. And I thank you this morning, Father, that as we lay our hands on them, they are receiving that impartation of Holy Spirit today. Come on, church, stretch your hands this way. Just begin to worship. Just begin to sing this song loudly today. Pastors, I want you to just begin to go to them, begin to pray over them, lay your hands on them, and they're going to begin to receive Holy Spirit in a brand new way today. And just open your mouth and begin to pray. We release tongues today over you. We release that in your life today. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. That fresh and filling. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I bless Him, Lord. Receive the Holy Spirit. 